Good to see you guys here this evening. It's good to be with you. I'd like for you to uh, prepare. Uh, this is um, it's, it's different than a sermon, really, because it's, it's confession, and um, we're going to be looking through that. And so I'd like for you to prepare, if you would, uh, as we begin. If, if you have your own copy of the confession, then you have to kind of be on your own in way of, in way of finding that. But if you have, uh, if you have the, the Trinity hymnal uh, on page 671, is where you'll find the, uh, the portion that we will be in. This is chapter 2, paragraph 2. And it's at the bottom of page 671. And then it, it goes uh, right on to 672 on the top of page 672. We'll be looking at that. So if you want to use the hymnal, you're more than welcome to, obviously. And then if you have your own copy or on your phone or however that may, however that may work. And then I'll be... Uh, we'll be looking together as we begin in Exodus. So if you would, turn in your Bibles to Exodus. Exodus 24. All right. Let's go to our Lord and ask him to help us this evening. Let us now lift up our hearts with our eyes and hands to God in heaven. Let us rouse ourselves to take hold of God, to seek his face, to ascribe to him the glory that is due his name. Unto you, O Lord, unto you do we lift up our souls. Let us now with confidence enter that holy place that the blood of Jesus Christ our Savior purchased for us by the new and living way that's opened for us through the curtain that is through his flesh let us now attend to the Lord with undivided devotion give us eyes that are singular for his glory and let not our hearts be far from him as we draw near to him with our mouths with honor towards him with our lips May we stand before you as we ought. Let now our worship, worship you, our God, who is spirit, in spirit and truth, who is our Father. Search our hearts. Stir us to see and to be captivated by the glory of our God, that we might be a people who are strengthened in our profound weakness You are sufficient. And for these things, we thank you. Amen. Exodus 24. Exodus 24. Trying to arrange my uh, new pulpit, right? You don't know exactly how to get your stuff on here um, exactly right. The God of the brick-making Hebrews had proved his sovereign reign over Pharaoh and all of Egypt. They're all of their deities earlier in the book of Exodus. This was punctuated by an exclamation mark with the crossing of the Red Sea. God's people seeing dead bodies wash up on the wilderness side of the seashore. Now they are to worship and serve this God who had done these amazing things. How are we to approach this God? How are we to worship this one who has brought us through so many amazing things? Why do we deserve this? Toward the end of this, the people of God were given the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments. And they were told and given some explanation, uh, 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 more explanation of what those Ten Commandments are to be and how they're to be lived out as they enter into this long promised land, this homeland, this rest, this place of rest and flourishing. And as they head that way, they're called to confirm the covenant of their God. And this is where we find ourselves in Exodus chapter 24, verse 1. Then he said to Moses, come up to The Lord, 
you and Aaron and Nadab and Abihu and 70 of the elders of Israel and worship from afar. Verse 2, Moses alone, Moses alone shall come near to the Lord, but the others shall not come near. The people shall not come up with him. So this is a God who, who has very clear boundaries. He's not being casual here. He's being very careful. It's a holy God. Verse 3, Moses came and took the people. All the word, excuse me, Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the rules. And all the people answered with one voice and said, All the words that the Lord has spoken, we will do. Wow. You've been there, haven't you? I have. I'm going to follow Jesus whatever it takes. I'm going to go where the Lord wants me to go. I don't think they were lying. Moses wrote down all the words of the Lord, and he he rose early in the morning and built an altar altar at the foot of the mountain, 12 pillars, according to the 12 tribes of Israel. Don't you think the people of God at that point are thinking, what are you doing? What is all this about? And he sent, verse 5, and he sent young men of the people of Israel who offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings and oxen to the Lord. And Moses took half of the blood, verse 6, put it in basins. Half of the blood he threw against the altar. And then he took the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people. And they said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And we will be obedient. Verse 8. Moses took the blood, threw it on the people and said, Behold the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance to all these words. It's a sober time. They realized that this wasn't, this wasn't a light matter. Jump down with me, if you will, to verse 15. Then Moses went up to, on the mountain, and a cloud, and a cloud covered the mountain, The glory of the Lord dwelt on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it six days. And on the seventh day he called to Moses out of the midst of the cloud. Now the appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire. On the top of the mountain and in the sight of the people of Israel, Moses entered the cloud and went up on the mountain. And Moses was on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. Though these Hebrews had grown to know something of who their God was through the miracles, through the powerful ways that he had worked to deliver them, they had not yet learned how they were to relate to their God. They had not yet learned how it was that they were to interact, worship, serve their God. He was a God still, though he had revealed himself, if you will, like Romans 1.20, his eternal power and his divine nature. He revealed himself in those ways, but they still were very distant and they knew it. They knew there was a cloud and a mountain. There was mystery. They couldn't come to their God in any way they desired. If they were to relate to their God, it had to be on his terms. The way that their God said that they could commune with him. This evening, that's exactly where we are. Last night, Pastor Don helpfully allowed us to look at chapter 2, paragraph 1, and explain to us who our God is. Tonight, we're going to be looking at chapter 2, paragraph 2, and be considering together how do we relate to our God? How might we relate to our God? Now, I want you to notice if you're looking at the confession there, And noticing that this is the second of three paragraphs in chapter 2 on God and the Holy Trinity. I want us to notice that. I want us to notice the placing here. If you think of it, if you will, like building blocks. The first building block was last night, paragraph 1. And we considered there uh, these, these absolute characteristics, these absolute perfections, as Pastor Don shared with us of who God is in and of himself, without respect to his creatures, necessarily. Now, 
This is also sometimes referred to as his imminent, imminent characteristics. So this paragraph then begins this building blocks, and it's the first of the three. And then we have with us tonight paragraph two that's going to be looking at the Lord's relative characteristics or perfections. And this is how he then relates to us. That's what I mean by relative. Sometimes these are also referred to as his economic characteristics. We will spend our time tonight working through this paragraph, paragraph two, as it relates to these relative attributes or perfections. But I don't want us to miss the placement of this paragraph with one other paragraph, a third, if you will, block to put on top of this to build our three-block tower. And it is paragraph three. And I'm not going to spend much time there because, um, one, it's hard. <laughs> Two, uh, I just simply want us to see where we're going. What is paragraphs one, then two on top of that, and then paragraph three, what are we after? Look at the end of paragraph three in your confession. Which doctrine of the Trinity is the foundation of our communion with God and comfortable dependence on him? That's what we're after, right? That's what, that's what we're aiming at. And, and we, we don't just go there easily. We've got we to work through some, some very significant things as we get there. And Lord willing, I'm going to leave that in the competent hands of Kirk for tomorrow uh, to be able to handle all of that and bring all those things together for us. But this is what I do, do not want you to I do not want you to miss here uh, as we look at this together. If we were only going to focus on two one, we would have a transcendent God that's other, that's on the mountain, that's in the cloud, that no one can touch. We can only tremble at. And I fear that so many today think of God in that way, in that way alone. If we have only paragraph three. It's easy, I think, for us to have a, a clear definition of orthodox Trinitarianism, sure enough, but we, wouldn't we be in danger if we only had that paragraph of slipping into the idea of, all right, he's three in one, one essence, eternal operations, three persons or subsistences, and we begin explaining and then re-explaining and then being more precise and careful with all the explanations God can easily then become a math problem that we're always having to work through and make sure we've got exactly right or we're saying something incredibly horrible, right? But we have paragraph two. This is, this is a God who wants to relate to us. A God who is saying, come to the mountain and though there's a cloud and though there's a mountain, I want you to know me so that it might be the foundation of all of our communion with God, our comfortable dependence upon him. And so this is our aim tonight, is to look together at paragraph 2 and, Lord willing, be encouraged by the truth of our God who seeks to relate to us this evening as we look together at this. So with this context and hopefully framework, we are going to look at paragraph 2. And we're going to simply do this. Um, we're going to, hopefully I'll be able to unpack, explain the paragraph as we work through it. And then for each aspect of this or each category of this paragraph, I'm hoping to give some application. And so this is going to be the path that we'll be going on, these five categories, which are typically and commonly broken up this way. If you look at a lot of the expositions, you find that it is broken up. Paragraph 2 is broken up into these five categories of how the Lord relates to his creatures. And so I'm just going to follow that path. I think both Waldron and Renahan break it up in this way. So I'm on safe territory if I'm following after those guys, right? And in each of these categories, I want us to notice that the Lord, and this is the word I want us to use or I want us to see or understand this tonight, is that in the Lord's relation to us, here's the word I want to choose. The Lord is supreme in all the ways that he relates to us. In other words, there is no other like him in that characteristic or category. Does that make sense? And so in these five categories, these five points for the sermon, lecture, whatever you want to call it tonight, devotion, however you want to understand it, we're going to look at the supremacy of our God towards his creator, toward his creatures, and these are five different ways that he is supreme 
and related in relation to his creatures. And here are the five points for this evening and the tracks that we'll be running on. Point number one, God is supreme in his life. God is supreme in his life. Point number two, God is supreme in his power. God is supreme in his power. Point number three, God is supreme in his knowledge. In his knowledge. And then point number five, no, it's good. Point number four, I jumped one. Point number four, God is supreme in his holiness. And then point number five, God is supreme in his lordship. All right. Point number one, life. Number two, power. Number three, knowledge. Number four, holiness. Number five, lordship. Lordship. Point number one, God is supreme in his life. Now, look with me in the bottom of page 671 in your confession. And I want you to follow along with me as we look at this together. The paragraph turns now and begins to help us see how God is supreme in his life. Follow with me. God, having all life, glory, goodness, blessedness in and of himself, is alone in and unto himself all sufficient, not standing in need of any creature which he hath made, nor deriving any glory from them, but only manifesting his own glory in, by, unto, and upon them. Simply said, God is different, not simply in extent, but in kind. In other words, God is not just a bigger, better, more wonderful version of any one of us or all of us collectively together. No, we see here how God is different in all of who he is. And notice with me, what, what could be more captivating to our souls than to know where we can go and what we can look to or who we can look to to possess, notice, all life, glory, goodness, blessedness. Imagine your life being full of those things. Imagine the life of those that you love, your congregation, your, 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 your family, being full of life and glory and goodness and blessedness. Every lack is a lack of these things, isn't it? Every want in our soul is a want for these things. And what it says is this. Look what our confession says. All, all life, all goodness, excuse me, all glory, all goodness, all blessedness, where is it found? It's found in and of himself. That's where we go is to our God. That's where we must go if we find any of these attributes anywhere. Anywhere we are going to go to him in and of himself. These four perfections are the very essence of what our soul longs for and pursues. And every creature that God created, these are the things they want. We were made to know and to receive these things. But we all have come. We all, each and every one, and every soul that you preach to next Sunday or that you're interacting with in your family, each and every one of us knows we do not find these things in us. We can't find them in our own souls. We can't stir them up inside. We can't make it stick. However, I don't want you to understand, misunderstand. God does not simply possess these things, nor does he simply have them stored up in a reservoir somewhere, dispensing them as he needs to. As we have, as, as, as we have need of them, he draws from this source and then gives it to us. No, God himself not only possesses life, glory, goodness, and blessedness, but as has been said over and over again, he is all these. 
in him or in and of himself, it says. This means then, brothers and sisters, boys and girls, this means that when we seek God, we are not somehow drawing on a particular amount of his reserves. Instead, in him, all creation finds all life, glory, goodness, and blessedness until consummation, we can draw from that well. And until that end, at that moment of human history, when all is made right, the Lord will not be depleted one bit on that day when all of his creation is before his presence in glory. He will not say, oh, didn't think I would quite make it. I didn't, didn't know if I had enough reserves to get all that. No, he would not be depleted at all. But I think states it this way. God's existence is not exhausted by the existence of the world. Eternity does not fully empty itself in time. Infinity is not identical with the sum total of finite beings. Let me read that again. It's easier when you read them, isn't it? In, uh, infinity is not identical with the sum total of finite beings. Omniscience does not coincide with the intellectual content embodied in all creatures. So also, God's omnipotence infinitely transcends even the boundless power manifested by all the world. So what Bavink is saying is that Life and glory and goodness and blessedness is in and of himself and therefore is not to be understood as something God has, but who he is. Our confession continues by stating this. Look with me at the confession again. It says, God is alone in and unto himself, all sufficient, not standing in need of any creature which he hath made, nor deriving any glory from them. In other words, not only does, does, uh, not, not only does any of his creatures deplete his, his, his blessedness, but God is in no way ever added to in his blessedness. You see what it's doing here in our confession. Now this self-existence, this self-sufficiency, is often referred to as his aseity, especially, or more broadly, as his independence. Instead, only God, only God is the source of these necessary gifts of life and glory and goodness and blessedness. And if we are to know these, to any extent, we must know them as we Go by faith to our God. That really does narrow the scope of our resources, doesn't it? We don't have a thousand different things that we need to bring to the table to help our own souls or the souls of our people or our family members or our loved ones. We have to bring them before a holy God by the blood of Jesus Christ and faith in him, right? And when we do, we're not bringing them something that will just kind of help them kind of along in their process. No, we're bringing them to a God of all life, glory, goodness, blessedness. For God alone manifests, notice our confession, his own glory. He manifests his own glory in, by, unto, and upon them. That is his creatures. You, me, your, your community that you live in, your congregation, your family, your extended family. God is the singular and sufficient source of all that they need. Now, brothers, I know that you know what it's like to be depleted. To be empty and bare. And I've, I've actually heard some of you give that very testimony, maybe are articulate in the saying, I'm tired and weary. Or so many of us have been there and we can see it on you because it's familiar. 
I want to commend to you tonight that our God is not depleted, brothers. He is not one who is empty, and you can go to him. He is your source. Don't get tired of going to him as if if you might be drawing just a little too much than you need to. The other guys need help too, right? No, go to our God. It often seems that our congregation would be more than happy to take our last breath if we would be willing to give it to them. No matter how much you give, you think, you know what, if I can just do this one more trip or this one more favor or this one more act of love, maybe they'll, they'll, they'll come around and they won't need me so much in the future. And we find that that's never the case. Who is sufficient for these things? 2 Corinthians 2.16 It is our God who is the source of all life, glory, goodness, and blessedness. Look to him when your soul is barren, weary, and empty. He is the only place where you will find strength. Further, brother, you, you don't possess, and you never have possessed the life that your wife needs so that she can continue another week with all the kids around her. I want to lift that burden off of you. You don't have that possession. But God does. You don't have the glory to sustain the member who is grieving over that horrific loss in their life or in their family. But our God is all glory. That's what our Confession says, all glory. Pastor, you do not possess the goodness in you, and you're not able to point to anything in this world that will encourage that young lady who is still not married or not pregnant. Telling her that there is still goodness that she can rejoice in. But our God possesses all goodness. Enough goodness to sustain that tender soul. Shepherds, you will not find the blessedness necessary to pray with that dying saint, not knowing if you'll make it back to the hospital again before he dies. But the Lord Jesus Christ has all blessedness. Point him to Jesus. Point him to Jesus. Our God will manifest all blessedness to that dear saint in his last moments. You cannot do that. You are not supposed to. God is not only supreme in his life. Point number two, God is supreme in his power. Our confession now turns from the Lord's life to our Lord's, our God's ability. Look again with me at the confession. Find your place there where it begins. I believe it's after the semicolon there. It says, he is the alone fountain. You see that? He is the alone fountain of all being, of whom, through whom, and to whom are all things. And he hath most sovereign dominion over all creatures to do by them, for them, and upon them whatsoever himself pleases. We must not think of God's being or his life separate from God's ability or his power. In other words, we see here how God's being necessarily flows right into God's ability, and we must always understand them together. Our confession explains that the life that is promised above has only one fountain. The life that's just been described has only one fountain, one source. He is the alone, do you see that? The alone fountain of all being. 
only one fountain, only one place to go. And if we ask, what does confession mean when it says this? We see, as our framers so often are helpful to do, they explain it for us. What does it mean for him to be the alone fountain of all being? We see that this metaphor is explained by saying that God is the source of all our being. It says, of whom? The source of all our being. He is, God is the agent of all our being. Through whom? The source of our being. Of whom? The agent of all of our being. Through whom? And God is the end of all of our being. To whom? Do you see that? Of whom? Through whom? To whom? Why is this urgent and necessary for us to understand? Why is it urgent and necessary to know that the only fountain, the only source, agent, and end for the fountain of all of our being, why is it so important that it is found alone in God? The answer is so evident and so incredibly urgent, it is overlooked. It's overlooked and doesn't even come into your mind much like the very oxygen in this room that's keeping you alive that you haven't thought about yet tonight. And yet, if it wasn't here, it would be the only thing we'd think about. Every creature, every man or woman, boy or girl, that sits under the preaching of the word in your congregation every single week is dreadfully aware that they can't stay alive themselves. They cannot enjoy glory. They are not guaranteed good. They do not know blessedness, and they can't find it on their own. And some of these people are frantic because they feel like it's their responsibility to do that. And everything in them fights against this very truth and pursues with every fiber in their being to possess and gain these blessed things that the Lord alone provides. And the reason they're so frantic and insane and crazy and anxious and bothered and struggling is because they are looking in broken cisterns when they have a fountain that is willing to give them this fresh water of all that they need. But the world's promising them Go there, go here, spend time there, and you'll find goodness and glory, blessedness. It's disappointed everybody everywhere. There's not one who doesn't know that there's no no satisfaction there. But the commercials keep going. We're called to declare, brothers that there's an infinite fullness and goodness and glory in God and he is the only fountain through faith in Jesus Christ that can be found these things. Do not let up. Do not let up. I fear, and I'm glad we're here tonight, because I fear you might be like me and you become, you're in this world too, right? You, you, You go to the places, you see the things, Your soul also needs to be convinced. You too grow weary. You too begin wondering, is this just an add-on, kind of a stick-on thing to the rest of our lives to make things kind of just a little better to get through? Or is our God the fullness, the fountain of all being? Now notice how our confession speaks of the extent of God's sovereign dominion over his creatures. Our confession says, look with me, and he hath most sovereign dominion over all creatures to do by them, for them, and upon them whatsoever himself pleases. First, his sovereign power, powerful, excuse me, his sovereign powerful dominion uses his creatures to accomplish his sovereign dominion. It says, to do by them. In other words, the Lord works volitionally and rationally with his creatures to accomplish through them his sovereign plans. That's, that's, that's amazing. What it basically means is that the Lord uses 
broken, messed up, stumbling guys like us. And he powerfully works through us. That's amazing. That's astonishing. We need to never forget that. It should never continue to shock us. But our confession goes on to say that the reason for the reason God does this is for them. It says for his creatures. And God providentially accomplishes his acts upon his creatures to declare to all creation that he is sovereign over all in his being for their advantage and for his glory. Listen, listen to this carefully. The Lord, who is God without us, Did you hear that? The Lord who is God without us and has no need of any of us has yet determined to be God with us and for us. That should make us gasp, shouldn't it? It should make us say, "What, what glory? What wonder? There is nothing in all creation so hard and impossible to capture, would you agree or disagree? There is nothing more hard and impossible to capture than a wicked human heart. Are you still praying for that, for that loved one? That husband or maybe wife of a member in your congregation? That wayward child? Don't ever begin to allow your heart and your mind to begin to think that that one is stronger than God. In your prayers, and maybe even in your prayerlessness, that's the kind of theology, the kind of foolishness that we go to in our sin. There is nothing as hard and as possible to capture as a wicked human heart especially one that's convinced that they can be satisfied by the things of this world and they're going as hard as they can to consume as much of the world as they can and when that thing fails them, they're going to go to another. Or maybe I just need more money. Or maybe I just need more of this. Or maybe I need just more of that. Maybe somehow I can get enough that it will finally satisfy me. We know the foolishness of that logic, but we know how incredibly profound it is as well. How just pervasive it is. And I'm not just talking about the world out there, brothers and sisters. I'm talking about the people that are in our congregations. They need to hear about this God that we are declaring here. He is sovereign. And there are a few doctrines that will stir up more hatred than being clear about what the scriptures say about the sovereign dominion of God over all creatures. Is there not? That will, that will stir people. That will make people mad, make people leave. Spurgeon says, There is nothing for which the children of God ought more earnestly to contend for than the dominion of their master over all creation, the kingship of God over all, the works of his own hands, the very throne of God, and his right to sit upon that throne. And on the other hand, Spurgeon continues, there is no doctrine more hated by worldlings. Men will allow God to be everywhere except for on his throne. May we be clear, men, when we preach the sovereign dominion of God over every man and woman, boy and girl, and declare with clarity and without stuttering that our God is sovereign. And that the world is not a declaration of his impotence. Be warned. Be warned that our own hearts may not deny the sovereign dominion of our God. But we are just as apt as anyone else to begin redefining it and explaining it in ways that practically disregard his sovereignty in our own lives and the lives of others. This is what happens when we, brothers and sisters, become anxious and fearful of our own hearts and the hearts of our people. 
hearts of our children, hearts of those that we love. We're redefining the sovereign dominion of God. Faithfully, be confident and fervent in your prayers to our God, because he is able. And you will find that those as great as the pagan king Nebuchadnezzar will one day declare, testify, his dominion is an everlasting dominion. Daniel chapter 4. And his kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing. He does according to his will among the hosts of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand or say to him, what have you done? That's the testimony of a pagan king who owned it all and realized that God is sovereign. He's not. Point number three. Point number three, God is supreme in his life, number one. God is supreme in his power, number two. Number three, God is supreme in his knowledge. Now, if you're looking at the confession in our Trinity hymnal, that's at the top of the next page. So if you would turn there. It says there at the top of page 672, In his sight all things are open and manifest. His knowledge is infinite, infallible, and independent upon the creature, so as nothing is to him contingent or uncertain. One of the most comforting and at the same time terrifying truths of Scripture is that our God sees everything. The last time you sinned, which probably wasn't too long ago, you did not believe that. You didn't believe that. The Apostle John wants the bewildered saints of his day to rest in this secure truth as they are struggling as early saints and Christians in the church. John insists in 1 John chapter 1, verse 5, this is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. This is what our, that portion of our, our confession means. This is what it means when it says God's sight, that in God's sight all things are open and manifest. Do you see that there? In his sight all things are open and manifest. That's what it means. That God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. That's what, it's, that's what it's primarily speaking of. What is the primary function of light, then? It is to make things clear and manifest. To bring things from the darkness and from hiding, and to expose things for what they are. To bring them to light, as we would say. God's knowledge, then, is perfect. The author of Hebrews says, no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we, you and I, each and every one of us must give an account. But notice how our confession continues to explain the character of God's knowledge with these three terms. His knowledge is, here they are, infinite, infallible, and independent. First, his knowledge is infinite. That means it is without limits. Without limits. How vast are, are the Lord's thoughts? I know, the verse just came to your mind, didn't it? Job ponders this truth. He says in Job 11, verse 7, Can you find out the deep things of God? Can you find out the limit of the Almighty? It is higher than heaven. What can you do? Deeper than Sheol, what can you know? Isaiah the prophet declares, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my, thought, my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. All of the theologies you read 
will point to one fundamental important truth concerning this particular characteristic or perfection. And it is this. The greatest object of God's knowledge is himself. And if that is settled, then a lot of other things are straight. Joel Beakey says that this is clearly established when the Lord reveals himself as the I am. As the I am. For God is self-conscious and therefore he and he alone can reveal himself to his creatures. No one else can. With his self-knowledge, then, God fully comprehends everything that he created, all that exists, along with universal perception of everything that happens in the past, present, and future. So God's knowledge is infinite without limits. But not only that, God's knowledge is infallible, meaning it is without error. God's knowledge is not and does not have any error in it. The Lord is not some massive mainframe computer that possesses all data and is simply processing all the facts and causing things to happen like some deified algorithm that's causing the world to run as it should, using the best information that's out there. That's not our God. What most are fearing today with what is called AI is is something to this effect. And don't be... Don't be foolish as to assume that our world and our culture isn't turning their thoughts to these things and giving authority and honor and glory to those things because they, they, they long for, their, song, their souls long for one who knows all things. No, instead, the Lord does not merely know all things in his omniscience, He does not merely calculate the best option from all the potentials. He is also eternally wise, meaning he's infallible. We must never separate the Lord's knowledge from his wisdom, for he is simple and thus not only possesses both knowledge and wisdom, but he is both omniscient and wise, always and forever, never wavering, increasing or decreasing in his knowledge or wisdom, Never once making a choice and then seeing a better option and saying, you know what, next time I'll make another choice. Against, again, Babink clear, is clear, clarifying here. But God is eternal. Pure being. The content of his self-knowledge is no less than this full, eternal, divine being itself. Being and knowing Coincide, coincide in God. He knows himself through his being. In him, consciousness is not the product of a gradual process of development, nor does this consciousness fluctuate from moment to moment, for in him there is no becoming, no process, no development, only being. He is pure being. Light without any mixture of darkness. Our God, in his knowledge, then, is infinite, without limits, infallible, without error. Thirdly, thirdly, he is independent, meaning that he's without influence. Without influence. No creature has ever or will ever inform our God. And the reason was just stated. Because his knowledge is not based in his creatures, it's based in himself, in his being. So there's nothing for the Lord to become aware of. Then notice how the confession explains the result of such an extraordinary knowledge what, what such a supreme knowledge. This knowledge is such that it says, nothing is to him contingent or uncertain. You see that? This truth helps all of us in our information age in this way. As information becomes more and more deified, 
and computers are doing more and more, and people are more and more informed, and systems are being used more and more, and we're even being warned against them and the dangers of them, all of this and all of its scope boils down to this, and we can rest in this truth. There is nothing out there that the Lord is not fully aware of and aware that you will need to face. And the sufficiency of our God is enough to face it. All things come within the scope and knowledge, the scope of his knowledge and wisdom. Finally, very practically, brothers, um, speaking to you as pastors, I know there are other here, others here tonight, but um, you've been in elders' meetings, sitting around the table. You've talked about the family for about 15 minutes. Different elders have brought up different things that you've had conversations with this family or this spouse or that one, and different things are happening, and, and you're sitting there thinking, I have no idea what's going on there. None of that makes sense. I don't, I don't understand. How do I shepherd that, congregate, that, that, that family? I can't figure out what, what's driving them to make those decisions and do those things. I can't speak into that because I don't even know what there is there. And, and everything we're hearing is cloaked and shadowy. What's the heart situation there? Now, there are guys that I know, and some of you um, are just gifted at being able to just precisely evaluate and discern things. Um, I'm, I'm, the, I'm the real dull crayon in the box, right? I'm the, I'm the guy that it takes a few weeks for me to figure out, all right, all right, I got it now. Um, I'm never that, that, that confident. I'm always looking at that and thinking, I, I just, I don't, I'm not sure if I'm seeing that right. There's something there I can't put my finger on. Now I can jump in and be foolish. I've done that. I'm, I'm well versed at that. Jump in, say something is completely wrong. Our God knows. And, and we are not put here, brothers, to fix those people. And if the Lord, the Lord wants us to shepherd them in a specific way, he will give us clarity because he's not, he's not, he's not unable to do that. But until he does... Go to your God who knows and ask him for either clarity or in his grace to fix it by his spirit because he can do it better anyway. Right? So, brothers, lean on this infallible, infinite, this, this independent knowledge of our God. And don't think that we are somehow... Um, we, we somehow need to have God's knowledge in order to be the shepherds that we need to be. We do not need to know perfectly all the circumstances and situations and hearts of our people in order for us to care and shepherd for them well, because God does. And remember, remember, don't forget, first part of paragraph two, in him is all life, glory, goodness, Blessedness, not in us. Number four. The last couple points are going to be shorter. I know you're looking at your watch. You did give me three hours, right? Um, no, that's not true. Uh, I'm, I'm going to be wrapping up here soon. Number four. The last two points are shorter because the text is actually shorter in our confession. So look with me, if you will, at this last. It's actually just a line here, um, this last portion concerning God is supreme in his holiness. In his holiness. Notice, he is most holy in all his counsels. Do you see that there in the confession? He is most holy in all his counsels, in all his works, and in all his commandments. Do you see here how the Lord God is most holy in three particular ways according to our confession? In his counsels, meaning in his plans for creation, in his works or his activities toward his creatures, and in his commands or revealed, re revealed will for his creatures. All that God plans, does, and commands declares the splendor of his holiness, is what this is saying. You've got to quote Gill if you're going to 
teach on the confession, right? I mean, this is kind of a, it's, it's got to happen at some point. So here you go. This is a great, a great insight by John Gill concerning the holiness of God. He says that holiness is not so much a particular or distinct attribute of itself as it is the very luster, glory, and harmony of all the other attributes. And is what is called the very beauty of the Lord, Psalm 27.4. As it is the beauty of the good angels is their holiness. And the regenerate man, our beauty, is in our holiness. And indeed, what is wisdom or knowledge, Gil goes on to say, without holiness? What is wisdom and knowledge without holiness but craft and cunning? What is power without holiness but tyranny and oppression and cruelty? But God is glorious in holiness. Ezekiel, uh, Exodus 15, 11. And that means that His holiness reflects the very luster of His perfections and the very glory of them. It is, it is exactly this attribute of God. The holiness of God. Believing that His holiness is worth living for and dying for. That will give us the anchor for our souls when everything is, is flying apart. In our darkest time, in our darkest moments, when it seems that, that, that the Lord is doing nothing but difficult, hard providence, the only solace, solace and comfort of our souls is that the Lord is holy. I don't understand what holy means but this can't be not holy because everything God does is holy. Turn with me to Psalm 22 in your Bibles. Let's go to our Bibles. As you go, as you go to Psalm 22 in your Bibles, I want to read to you Jesus who's quoting Psalm 22. Jesus is quoting Psalm 22 when he's on the cross on Mar in Mark chapter 15, verse 34. Keep turning to Psalm 22. But in Mark 15, 34, Jesus in his darkest hour, the darkest hour for any human on earth ever, the most heinous time in all of history, and the wrath of God is being poured out on the Son of Man. Jesus turns to his psalter and it says in Mark 15, 34, And at the ninth hour Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama shabbatani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? What truth? What, what truth can sustain our Savior at such a ghastly hour at such a difficult time he turns to Psalm 22 and if you're there with me read or follow along with me Psalm 22 verse 1 my God, my God why have you forsaken me why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning oh my God I cry by day but you do not answer and by night, but I find no rest. What truth? What truth is our Savior clinging to? Look at verse 3 in there in Psalm 22. Yet you are holy. In the midst of this hardship, in the midst of this, this horror, in the midst of this darkness, in the midst of this groaning, He says, yet you are holy, God. You are enthroned on the praises of Israel in this darkest hour. In you, our fathers trusted. They trusted, and what did you do, God? You delivered them because you are holy. To you they cried, and they were rescued because you were holy. In you they trusted, and they were not put to shame. Brothers, when the trials come into your life, and into your ministry, 
and even, and even so dare to afflict your very family and home. You and I are able to say, yet you are holy, Lord God. I don't understand it, and you do not have to explain, but the truth is sure and steady that no matter what comes, you are holy. And we can rest secure in this truth. Our Lord God is most holy in his counsels. He is most holy in all of his works in our lives and in our congregation. He is most holy in all his commands that he calls us to and to live in. Because Psalm 145 says, You open your hand and you satisfy the desire of every living thing. The Lord is righteous. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and kind in all his works. The Lord preserves all who love him. He is holy. Finally, number five. Let's uh, let's wrap up this evening and look at these last few lines here. Notice the the beginning where it starts there. In him is due. Do you see that in your confession? In him is due from angels and men. Whatsoever worship, service, or obedience as creatures they owe unto the Creator, and whatever He is further pleased to require of them. This point is so very necessary for us to understand this evening as we close this time and as we come to the end of this paragraph of our confession. How our confession ends here is very important. If you misunderstand the Lord God in all of His supremacy described... In paragraph 2, if you either ignore or reject the ways God relates to his creatures, then this error is not simply or merely a cognitive problem that you have, a simple misunderstanding or mistake. It is not just a minor confusion or miscalculation on your part, but instead you are participating in idolatrous, idolatrous worship. You are living and worshiping a false deity of your own making. For God alone is due all worship, service, and obedience from every creature as heavenly as the angels, our confession says, and as earthly as humanity. Brothers, as pastors of your churches, when you are more influenced by your people's needs and their demands that they are pressing on you, they're not going to come to you and say, you know what, I just need you to declare to me the glories of Jesus Christ because that's all that my soul needs. No, they're going to come to you with what their TikTok told them they needed and why the Bible isn't sufficient. That's what they're going to do. When your people's needs are demanding upon you and they're seeking some help, is what they'll say. And they're seeking from you that help. Do not be Aaron. Do not be Aaron. Do you remember we left Moses on the mountain in the cloud? He was up there for 40 days. You know those people at the bottom of the mountain? We will obey. Take your Bibles and turn to Exodus 32. Exodus 32. They knew who their God was, right? Chapter 2, paragraph 1 of our confession. They knew. They were being, they were being told. They, they, they knew God was God over all of Egypt. You know, he did all of the amazing miracles. They saw bodies washing up on the seashore. Did they know how to relate to their God? Did they know that their God was, how, how to relate in that way? Exodus 32, Moses is up in that mountain. Verse 1 of chapter 32, when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain. It won't take long 
In fact, you're here this week. Does your church like lay down and don't do anything while you're away because they're so kind and gracious to say, you know what, our pastor needs a break. While he's away, we're just going to, our marriages are going to be great, everything's going to be fine. No, no, you've gotten texts and phone calls all week. You're going back to it in a couple of days. You might even have to leave early, right? On the mountain, Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, and the people gathered themselves together to Aaron and said to him, Up, make us gods who shall go before us. This, this should make us weak because this is our hearts. This is us. Hmm. Make us gods that shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. So Aaron had a great idea. He said to them, Take off the rings and of gold that are in the ears of your wives and your sons. You realize those, that's the pillaging that they did of Egypt. I mean, it's nothing but a testimony that God gave them that. They not only escaped with their lives from Egypt, but they actually had all this stuff. And now they're going to use the very thing that the Lord blessed them with as, a, as, as idols. So all the people, verse 3, took off the rings of gold that were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from their hand and fashioned it with a graven tool and made a golden calf. And they said, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Amazing. Do not be Aaron, who chose to cater to the perceived needs of the people, and in so doing, did not, would not turn them to God. Our God calls us to have no other gods before him. Our Baptist catechism states at the very foundation, the very beginning of our catechism says, who is the first and chiefest being? God is the first and chiefest being. Ought, question two, ought everyone to believe there is a God? Everyone ought to believe that there is a God. I don't think much of the world would probably, most of our congregations wouldn't be bothered by that. But you know how many people, when you read this last part, they get bothered by the fact that I continue when I read question or answer two, and it says, and it is their great sin and folly. Not to. We live in a world, and I want to make the case that we have people sitting in our churches week in and week out that are not merely secular brothers. They are pagan in much of their thinking. And, and, and some of that falls on our shoulders we need to teach them out of their paganism. The deities of Egypt don't match up. They're not even close. The deities of America don't match up. They're not even close. In other words, there's different kinds of paganism, and it's dressed up in different ways for us today. It's more sophisticated. I would dare say that you probably do not have many conversations with the eco-spiritualist or the New Age pantheist. Maybe you might have some conversations with the Star Wars-loving Mahana Buddhist. But more likely, more likely, you are in the midst of people who surround you every Sunday when they come to church who take sin way too lightly in their lives and are therefore practical atheists, are coming to church regularly, faithful, always there, until ball season or hunting season. And they're truly nothing less than polytheists. When we give our full adoration and love, not to God, but to our families, or to work, or to our hobby, hobbies, we must realize that this is no different than historic pantheism. There are those tonight here who think it's important to follow your heart, to, do, to be true to yourself. 
and are far more apt to determine what truth is by your emotions and feelings rather than by God's word. And in this way, you're nothing less than a modern-day panentheist. Those who are constantly overwhelmed and anxious about their health, their future, their comfort, instead of trusting God's providential sovereignty over their lives, have imbibed the finite theism of process theology that is pervasive in our culture today. Those young couples or families that are working two or three or four jobs to quote-unquote make ends meet, and the ends are the well-furnished house, the season passage to, passes to the college games, the boat, the lake house, the getaways, the weekend trips, to the point that they have no place to honor Lord's Day. What would that be called? The Apostle John was talking to believers in 1 John. He was talking to believers. He wasn't talking to the pagan culture out there. He was talking to the believers in 1 John, and he says to them, the very last verse of 1 John chapter 5, verse 21 says, Little children, keep yourself from idols. That's the church. And if you read through, back through 1 John, the most clear explanation of what might be those idols, it's hard to determine, except for when you get to 1 John chapter 2, verse 16, and it says this, For all that is in this world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, the pride of life, is not from the Father, but from the world. Why did the Lord allow Pharaoh's heart to be hardened over and over again? It was to show his people that he is Lord and there is no other. When your, when your congregation or your, one, of your, one of your members says, I'm going to believe this other thing. And I'm going to go after this because this person or this thing or this relationship or this whatever... You know, it's really helping me, and, and, and I've come to you over and over again, and you just keep telling me to, to have faith and repent, and it's not helping, so I'm going to go over here. Don't wring your hands and act like God is not able. That idol will fail them. Warn them of that idolatry. And sadly, a few months down the road, or maybe a couple of years down the road, They'll be sitting at your kitchen table, 5.30 last Monday morning, crying his eyes out, asking for forgiveness, and saying, I need Jesus. Because the Lord will definitively declare and manifest his glory to all his creatures. This truth, this fruit... His supreme lordship, this is point number five, this fruit, his supreme lordship, is really the fruit of all the other attributes that we've discussed tonight. When the Lord's supreme life and power and knowledge and holiness is manifest in all of our lives, in all of creation, in our, in our congregations, it will naturally create a confidence in our confession that you are the Lord. And there is no other. And we are only, we're only the first fruits of that, that praise, that adoration, that declaration. That's only the first fruits of a day that is coming when four living creatures and 24 elders will be saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. To receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Those words sound familiar, don't they? And I heard every creature, every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. And the saints here tonight said, Amen. Let us pray together. Almighty God in heaven, grant us confidence and faith that we may trust in you, our God. Help us, Father, as brothers 
in the faith as pastors, that we may encourage one another, that we may point one another back to our God often when our hearts are discouraged and weary. You are sufficient in every way. Your life, your power, your knowledge, your holiness declares your lordship. Oh, that our lives, our ministry, our congregations, our, our, our communities will reflect this very glory. We ask this in your son's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, brothers. If you'll stand, we'll be dismissed with the benediction from Revelation chapter 4. Verse 8, and the four living creatures, each one of them having six wings, are full of eyes around and within, and day and night they do not cease to say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. And when the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, to him who lives forever and ever. The 24 elders will fall down before him who sits on the throne and will worship him who lives forever and ever and will cast their crowns before the throne saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and because of your will they existed and were created. Amen.